here we are with Ellen from Parabon Nanolabs. Welcome to Issue 33, Ellen. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. Oh, that's so great. Are you having a good time? I love Ishi. This is the conference that I have to go to every year. What? Yeah. I How know. many have you been to? So we went to our first one in maybe 2013, like before oh, we were wow. even really doing forensic stuff. So yeah, I think I've only missed one. No that was kidding. Last year. Yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> so you missed Disney. Miss ah, Disney. that was a pretty good one. But yeah, it's it kind of pandemic-y, like, and it was um, yeah, it was a little odd, but is this is great, right? This is this really is awesome. good action. So glad we could get everybody together yes, for this. Yes, me too. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong. I was looking at some of the posters. Was there a crazy Parabon one about the identification of a vampire? Yes, a real life vampire. Really? Well, that's what they say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's remains that were from the 19th century that were okay. found in the early 20th century and just had uh, like tax in, on the grave that said spelled out JB55. Ta tax, like yeah. thumb tax. Yeah, like yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. And so we figured JB is probably the name, 55 yeah. maybe the age. Oh, but, okay. But uh, when they exhumed him, they found that his at some point after he'd been buried, he'd been dug back up, his femur bones had been taken off and crossed over his chest, which, if you read about it, this was the New England vampire panic. He oh actually gosh. died of tuberculosis, which gives you, you know, red eyes and pale skin and a cough and often would afflict people like long after the person had died and they okay. thought they were rising from the dead and so if he had his oh femurs crossed gosh. over his chest he could not rise from the grave that makes perfectly good sense exactly. and so then the question was who is he and so that was what this project was about was, can we get really good dna data from this historical sample yeah That's pretty cool i love it and so were you able to have that happen? What'd yeah. you find out? Yes, yeah. so we tested a couple of different approaches. Um, okay. So we were doing shotgun sequencing, which means just sequence everything that's in there. Sure. And then we were doing two targeted approaches, one that targets the whole human genome and okay. one that was a custom kit that we designed with 850,000 SNPs. And we found that both the oh whole gosh. genome and the 850,000. That's, shh, shh. <laughs> I'm talking to Ellen. <laughs> okay, they took care of <laughs> Both the whole genome and 850,000 worked very well. The shotgun okay. got a lot of bacteria. Oh, lot of bacteria yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, you know, the, the whole genome is about $100 a sample, and the 850,000 is about $1,000 a sample. So, oh, yeah, we were able to say yeah. this this is actually a protocol that you could use in a lab. And so we okay. did this work with Afdil. Afdil did the actual DNA work. Okay, nice. Um, the DNA extraction and the sequencing. And so now they have a protocol that they could use to try and get a whole sequence, a whole genome sequence data out of really difficult remains. That is something that I'm interested in because this had been buried, right, for yeah. a long time, had been there. How in the world would a person even get the DNA out of those remains? Is it pulverizing? Is it drilling? What what what's the protocol for that? So I believe you have to sort of sand off the surface because okay. that's where anybody has handled it. There, okay. yep. you need to get sort of down into the bone, and okay. so then I think it is drilling. You basically turn the bone into powder okay. and extract the DNA out of that. But the okay. DNA is going to be in pretty bad shape because yes. it's been sitting in a bone True. for, yeah. in okay. this case, two hundred years. That's a long time. Um, and also all the. DNA around it, all the bacteria and right. fungi okay. will get in there too. Yep. So that's the, the challenge. If you just go and yep. try to sequence everything, you get like 99% bacteria and just a yeah. little tiny bit of human. Yeah, get a lot of A's and G's and T's and C's from the other things. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, I understand that. So what does Parabon do? Like what is their, what was your function in all of that? Just coming up with a protocol for them to use or what does Parabon do? So we designed the 850K kit that we decided okay. we didn't need. Okay. Um, and we do <laughs> no, the bioinformatics. The work. So okay. we're going from the, the okay. DNA data, the sequence data, to something you can actually use. So we did DNA phenotyping, so we predicted okay. the guy's eye color, his hair color, and skin color. And since we have a forensic artist on staff, we were able to get 3D scans of his skull, digital, and he was able to put on those like tissue depth markers digitally. Yeah put skin over and so we reconstructed what he looked like with the phenotyping and the skull reconstruction. Did he have fangs? Well, you know, our models don't really cover that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. it's not really in the normal range of human variation. So that's, that's true. That's, that's true. something we should work on. But, yeah. yeah. And the and other I, part of it was we showed that we could upload these uh, these data files to GEDmatch. And so going forward, 
maybe genealogy could be used in these kinds of cases as oh my. well. So did you find out actually who the fellow was through the Jed match? Well, so they had previously, when they did previously work on this, they had okay. found, they had looked at his Y chromosome mm -hmm. and found Barber as a possible surname. So it was JB, okay. so they thought Barber. Barber would work. There wasn't, there wasn't a record of a sure. John Barber. Um, and in this case, so we, all we did was upload to Jed Match and sort of look at the trees of the matches. Sure. We haven't yeah. really done genealogy yet. But okay. Same thing led back to Barber ancestors in New England, you know, in the 1800s. So For real? definitely all signs pointing to yes that he's John okay. Barber. Okay. John Barber, the vampire. The vampire. Maybe. Of Griswold, Connecticut. Ooh, Griswold. <laughs> Okay, that is a fantastic story. That's so cool. What what else does Parabon do when they're not busy, you know, finding out if there are vampires from Connecticut? Well, we do work on a lot of cold cases, you okay. may have heard. Yes. Uh, yes, so we do a lot of uh, genetic genealogy on yeah. cold and active cases. Okay. Um, and then we actually have lots of other sides of our business as well, but they're not nearly as fun as the forensic work. Right. So in the forensics world, have you been able to, and I, I ask this of a lot of people because I'm not sure how this works in the world, if you are working on a case or you're providing assistance for a case, do you ever get to find out the ending result of those? We do. So the, the detectives are great about that. They'll okay. often send us an email or a call okay. to say, hey, just so you know, followed up on that lead, got the DNA match. You know, sometimes they want us to be in the press conference too, but mostly it's just sort of a courtesy. You know, oh, yeah. So, and sometimes it's like, we haven't arrested him yet, so don't, you know. Oh, I, yeah, <laughs> like, gosh, okay. you wouldn't want the cat out of the bag a little early. It's just yeah. sudden flights to other countries. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. That's really neat. So, uh, you know, what's your job there? What do you do for Parabon yourself? So I'm the director of bioinformatics. Okay. So I do, I oversee the whole snapshot division. Okay. So if you're familiar with Cece Moore, you know, she's yeah. kind of a big deal. Yeah. I'm her boss, technically. Oh but, my gosh, yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> but <laughs> she, <laughs> she needs no bossing. She is, she is the boss. She does okay yeah. herself? Okay. But uh, yeah, so I see, oversee all the bioinformatics work. Okay. I developed the DNA phenotyping system that has been sort of um, overshadowed by genetic genealogy, which is great. Yeah. Genetic genealogy is amazing. Super important. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And so a lot of, uh, so really when we started doing this, my work was, is it possible to make predictions from DNA? Yes. And then the question was, can we make predictions from forensic DNA? And so okay. that was sort of a big change. Was okay. What techniques can we use? Because in forensics, obviously at that time, it was all STRs. Yes. And you can't make predictions from STRs, you can't yep. do genealogy from STRs, and so we're bringing in this this SNP, this SNP approach that from the medical world mm -hmm. and saying, you know, you can actually do this on forensic samples, and so we were doing that starting in 2014 on law enforcement Oh, wow, samples. 2014? Yeah. It's not even that old. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> yeah. like not even a long time ago, but yeah. Yeah, and then in 2018, when genetic genealogy came along, we were able to sort of swoop in and say, well, we know exactly how to get the data that you need out yep. of these samples. And then more recently, we've been working on this whole genome sequencing. So with these really challenging samples for historical vampires, yes. we can actually get SNPs from really tough samples and, and solve those cases. Yeah, that is, it's amazing is what it is. It's really <laughs> cool. It's really amazing. And um, I did just want to know how in the world, as a youngster in your life, how did you decide to go into the world of forensics? Well, what led you down this path? I certainly did not see this coming. Okay. That way. It wasn't something that was like you're in high school and suddenly you're like, I just want to be in forensics. Yeah, well, I was in high school and I wanted to be an evolutionary biologist. So I well, went and did my kind PhD. Of did. Uh, yeah, I be did in my forensics. PhD in evolutionary yeah. biology okay. and then did a postdoc in bioinformatics and then saw this job ad from this small company I'd never heard of saying, you know, we're, we're trying to develop a DNA phenotyping system to predict what people look like from DNA and we need a biologist. I was like, well, that sounds like just about the coolest thing I can imagine. Yeah. But at that time, it wasn't. I mean, this was 2012. We weren't even thinking about the forensic aspect yet. Sure. And so sure. we had so much to learn. Oh my gosh, we had so much to learn. But yeah, we've been able to put the system together and then get it working with forensic samples, get it working with mixtures, get it working with bones, and yeah. now, now look yep. at the field and how much now, it's changed since yes. then. Yes, amazing. Yeah. And so, have you, you? How long have you been going to Ishii? Did you tell me? I think it's in 2013. 2013. So, yeah, so you kind of got in at that point knowing, right, that the forensics part was going to come along for you. and Yeah, we knew that was the eventual goal. We didn't yeah. know 
really what exactly what we were getting into. I still sure. remember yeah. they like wait they still use my they real still use um, STRs. Yeah. And I didn't know anybody was still doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so and also mixtures. You know, people come to us mix with mixtures. We had to invent sure. a new technique to decomplement yeah. mixtures for steps. Yeah. Because that was coming up. And, that you know. is interesting. So not to get too graphic here, but let's say if you were had a sample that was a mixture uh -huh. of body parts. I just watched some of that Dahmer. Okay. <laughs> let's just say, yeah. could you, by chance, extract out DNA out of a mixture of uh, maybe a liquid of body parts? Is that even possible? Yeah, so we work with two-person mixtures all the time. Okay. Those are usually sexual assault samples. Sure. But the thing is, if it's a pretty high mixture, we need a single source sample from the known contributor. Okay. So often if that's okay. the victim. Yep. And so uh, we need that to sort of subtract out that right. signal. Um, so yeah, it depends on, on the scenario and how many people are in that mixture. But right. we're definitely doing it. And, okay. and it's funny for me to go to Ishii every year because in 2013, 2014, we'd go around talking to people and saying, how about snips? Snips? Snips. We don't want to do snips. That yeah. has nothing to do with it. You can't get an STR profile from snips. And now look at Ishii. Yeah. All about snips. All about snips. Yeah. Thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. That was good work. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, my other question led me to another question. If you've got those mixtures of DNAs, um, now I've forgotten my question. Okay. Darn it. Darn it. It was a really good question. <laughs> let me think about that a minute now. I'm, I'm just going to let it go now. Um, so, do you guys um, have customers coming to you for this help, or are you going out and looking to help people in their laboratories do these different things? Like, how does that work? Yeah, in your customers world? come to us, and so okay. typically it's a detective who comes to us and okay. says, I have DNA at this crime scene, okay. no leads, can you help me? All right, okay. And so, I did remember my question. That is, do we have a database of people who are missing? Do you, do those families provide a sample of single source DNA that we are archiving somewhere in the world? Yeah, so that's part of what NamUs does. NamUs, okay. The missing and unidentified person system. Okay. Yeah, so one of their jobs is to collect DNA from family okay. references. I did not know that. That's yeah. probably an excellent thing to do. Yeah. And also for Aftil, the work that we do with Aftil, you know, they're okay. identifying soldiers from past conflicts going back to World War II. And so there, a lot of their work oh. is collecting family references as well. You know, we need to be able to compare. And so we had, we were helping them with some new software to do more distant relationships. Yeah. You know, because sometimes you can't get the mitochondrial DNA. Sometimes sure. you can't get STRs or you don't have a mitochondrial reference. Yeah. And so we've given them some software that they're validating right now and that we published that uh, can help them find up to fourth degree relatives. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that too. Thank you. This field, you've seen it, you know, growing from the STRs to the SNPs to the, you know, that. Where do you think it's going? What What's out there next? Ooh, How? Right. I know that's a super hard one. Because <laughs> if you knew, you'd be doing it now and you'd be selling it to everyone. <laughs> I know, and I don't want you to give anything away. <laughs> but where do you think it's going? I mean, what more can we do here? Well, what we're seeing a lot now is more active cases coming okay. to these new DNA techniques. I mean, I think they're really seen as tools for cold cases. Like you've yeah. been yeah. investigating it for 30 years and you still have been able to find the guy. Okay, let's sure. try genealogy. Okay. But occasionally we're seeing some cases it's like, well, this happened three weeks ago. We didn't get a hit in the database and we've been able to help solve those cases too. I guess. And every time that you do something like that, let's think of a genealogy one, you get that whole tree built, right? Mm -hmm. And then that gets archived. Right, so you put that somewhere so that it just keeps building and building and building. Is that true? I guess I mean, we it haven't really massive? had. I mean, we. It's pretty unusual, I guess, for the same different cases to have matches in any the same sort of family. matches. Yeah, yeah, I suppose but that's true. Get there eventually. Yeah, it's yeah. certainly something we check for. <laughs> yes, you. Yeah, brothers, sisters. <laughs> yeah. yeah, all the yeah, relatives. All right. Well, thank you so much for hanging out and talking yeah. with me today. Great talking with you. Will I see you at Ishii 34? Absolutely, so. positively, yes. Where's it going to be? Denver, oh, yeah. Colorado. Definitely. Bring your ski boots yes. and your skis <laughs> and your ski mask and all those things that people and use. And your hot chocolate. And your hot and chocolate. And your marshmallows on a stick. Okay. That's yeah. a good I idea. I know how to ski. You do? Oh. <laughs> That's my kind of skiing, too.
Yeah. Yep, as attested to this broken tooth that I have right here. The one, first time I ever went skiing, fell over, snapped it with the pole. The handle of the pole snapped my tooth right in half. So my DNA is probably still on Cascade Mountain. I'm hoping that there's no crimes done up there because they may actually be able to This detect. guy had to be there. His tooth yeah, was there. Yeah, he was there. Anyway, <laughs> if anyone could find it, it'd be Parabon. Thank you. Right? We'll All right. <laughs> well, thank you yeah, again. I'm going to stop speaking now. Okay. Thanks a lot for stopping by. Sure thing.